two, one, admitting all. And then tell me when to hit play. Okay, it'll. Uh, Other hand. Go ahead. Singled out. Um, earlier today, we had a peaceful demonstration here, building awareness of the situation in this facility. My brother is now in this white van. Um, as you can see, there's police here. We have um, Girmai, a King County representative councilman who's here. Um, and so this is totally uh, retaliatory by the DOC. Um, and so this is unacceptable. He didn't, he, had, he did nothing wrong. It was by his window. They said that he was banging on the window during the demonstration when that is incorrect. There's actually individuals in his facility who could corroborate that. And so this is un unbelievable, unbelievable. He, he is probably sick too. And so they are sending him to Shelton, which is totally unacceptable. My family here. My mom was so stressed out and fasting. She wasn't able to come. Um, so here we are. Brother is right here in this in this van for no reason, man. For no reason. I have the right to express my concern. Stand in solidarity with all of our brothers in this building and to bring awareness to the coronavirus outbreak. I think everybody in this facility is sick. And so this is this is a straight up retaliatory act. And this, this is not okay. My brother is supposed to be coming home at the end of May. Nothing wrong. <laughs> We're building awareness of the situation in this building where folks in here have coronavirus and there's not adequate testing, or adequate care. And so they are retaliating against my brother. <laughs> We're going to stop sharing the video and pass the mic to Nikita Oliver to start our program. Hello. Good morning. Um, let me just take a moment for a deep breath. Um, I want to welcome all of our family, uh, the loved ones of the Reynolds Six, and welcome our community members and um, advocates and allies who are here to undergird and amplify their voices and their story. I want to also acknowledge that we are in the homelands of the Duwamish people, the Coastal Salish territories, that we are in unoccupied Duwamish land, uh, if, if we are in what is called Seattle. 
And I want to acknowledge um, that on these ancestral lands, uh, this country was built by stolen black peoples, by stolen black lives. And it is important for us to be grounded from that position to understand what all has happened to these families and to the Reynolds Six. Uh, we're here to discuss uh, what the Reynolds Six families have suffered at the hands of the Department of Corrections and the retaliation that they've suffered um, by being a part of a community, by advocating and seeking safer conditions for their loved ones that are at Reynolds work release. And as a part of today's press conference, I'll be interviewing family members of the Reynolds Six. Um, and at the close of the morning's conversation, we will have a Q&A with select questions. So when we ask for a question and an answer, please direct message those to me. My name is Nikita Oliver. You can find me in the, in the chat feature. Um, if you go to the bottom of your screen, it'll allow you to do that. But please do not send questions until we ask for them. Otherwise, they may get lost uh, over the course of the hour. And I want to make sure um, I have the full breadth of questions to attempt to address. So my name is Nikita Oliver. I'm a local community organizer, artist, and lawyer. And I will be the moderator for today. Uh, our day is going to begin and end with Black mothers advocating for their sons to challenge the Department of Corrections retaliation and to bring to light the COVID-19 crisis in prisons and ongoing racial violence directed at Black families due to mass incarceration and state-sanctioned violence. But at the heart of what we're talking about today, that, that instead of joyful homecomings, the Department of Corrections caprice and racism means that they are often unchallenged at their abuse of power. And we want to uplift what can be done to bring justice to the Riddle Six and their families, to maintain safer conditions for our loved ones during COVID-19, to stop the tearing apart of our families, and to stop wasting money on caging people, and instead find ways to reroute back in our communities. So I just want to once again let y'all know there will be a question and answer time period that will be at the end of all of the family interviews and conversation with elected officials and community advocates. Please direct message those questions to me, but please wait until the time that we ask for them. Uh, we have a number of advocates and community leaders that have joined us in this struggle and uplifting the voices of the Reynolds Six and their families. And we recognize that this particular case, this incident, um, this particular injustice that is woven into many injustices is an interconnected issue. And so I speak to that and help us um, understand the context and the framework of things. Uh, we're going to hear from Anila Afsali. Thank you so much, Nikita. Uh, my name is Anila and I'm the Executive Director of the American Muslim Empowerment Network at the Muslim Association of Puget Sound. Uh, and I'm here supporting the Reynolds Six families, six families who have had their hopes and aspirations of being reunited with their loved ones shattered over trumped up charges. These families come from black, Muslim and indigenous communities. They feel the blows of structural racism every day. And today, you're going to hear about these six individuals who had been released from prison and were working on rebuilding their lives in the Reynolds Work Training Release Facility. They were about to be reunited with their families, but instead, on May Day, as you saw in the video that we played in the beginning, they got thrown back in prison with no real explanation of why or what their charges were and no ability to speak to their loved ones. And let's be clear. All this happened because a black Muslim mother and her daughters in hijab had the audacity to call for safety for their loved one during a global pandemic. Instead of heeding that call, the son of that mother was thrown in prison and the rest of the Reynolds Six were caught up as collateral damage as part of a dragnet. When I first heard about this case, I couldn't believe it. Now, I, of course, I see and hear about injustices every single day, and I understand the deep systemic injustices embedded in our justice system. 
but I was still shocked to learn about this happening here in Washington state, especially in the middle of a global pandemic. The lawyer in me was deeply troubled with the infringement on civil rights and retaliation for the exercise of free speech and assembly. The faith and community leader in me was deeply troubled with the public health risks and the carelessness with which these six men and others in prison and detention are treated when we have been working so hard with public health officials and even giving up our places of worship for over two months to help stop the spread of COVID-19. The Muslim in me was deeply troubled that all this happened during Ramadan, a time of spiritual reflection and celebration, and when some of the individuals were fasting and seemed to have been targeted. The human being in me was deeply troubled by the separation and dashed hopes of families who should be celebrating reunion with their loved ones right now instead of dealing with what they are. But the Reynolds Six families have stood strong through all of this, even during a challenging and changing time in America. And I commend them for courageously stepping forth to hopefully improve the system for all. Now this case really is a microcosm of national issues. We have an intersection of anti-Black racism, Islamophobia, xenophobia, the prison industrial complex, health concerns with COVID-19, poverty, and more. Right now, we have faith leaders, community advocates, and organizations, and everyday supporters in the press conference with us. And together, we are demanding justice for the Reynolds Six. And I also want to mention that I've been working with the governor's office on implementing healthcare directives around COVID-19. And there was a press conference I was on with them last week. Our places of worship and communities have been heeding the call of our governor. Will the governor heed our call for justice as well here? Governor Inslee, I know you have a lot on your plate, especially as you lead us through, out of this current crisis. You've also shared some beautiful words on health, safety, justice, a commitment to combating racism, Islamophobia, xenophobia, on respecting religion, uh, uh, respecting uh, our faith and prison reform. You even shared a Ramadan greeting with the Muslim community and we appreciate that. And I wanna say, if you say and believe that Black Lives Matter, if we care about COVID-19 and the health risks, if we care about prisons and the conditions for prisoners, if we care about civil rights and the freedoms that we have, including to protest, then please step up and take action here. Restore our faith in justice in this instance. You've already taken action to release some prisoners early, release the Reynolds Six as well uh, and do so now. These are people who should not even be in prison. So thank you in advance for doing the right thing here and the right just thing. And now please, well, I wanna ask everybody to join me in welcoming a mother who has paid a heavy price for courageously stepping forward during this pandemic, Mother Miriam. Thank you so much, Anila, uh, for highlighting that I mean, just in very important context for helping us understand the intersections. And thank you for the call for justice to Governor Ensley. Uh, we will now hear from Mother Marian Adem and uh, with her daughter Zizi. I think what is very significant about what has happened here is that um, Mother Marian and all of Levon's sisters and loved ones have been advocating for him for months. And on May 1st, when they were once again advocating and standing in solidarity with many other families and people, they saw a retaliation for that advocacy for their loved one. Mother Marian Adem, thank you so much for joining us with your daughter Zizi. Can you tell us a little more about what your concerns were around the conditions at Reynolds Work Release? Good morning, my name is Marian Farah. I am a Diva and Adam's mother, and uh, what I was concerning uh, it was uh, what's going on there, and uh, what's going on on all the nation and all the world. I am mother. I was worried my son, which is gone like eight years in the prison, is qualified to come the work release in downtown. He was working. He was doing anything, you know, like to come home and he's qualified. And what happened was that day, May 1st, 
everybody's come out for the rally and we was talking, I was concerning what's going on inside. These young guys, 80 of them, it's not only my son, sharing four bedrooms. They don't have enough equipment, which is gloves and what is protect them, masks, stuff like that. And I was worried his life because he's my son. I have only son I have. And uh, I am mother and any mother, she can raise that question. And what I was concerning his health. And I speak out with Somali language, that video that day, before that day, but that day happened. Everybody come out and after rally, they targeting my son, especially uh, after Saq and uh, Liban and saying, is that your mom? Is that your mom? And that means because I'm, I'm a black woman, I have a hijab, I look different. They know right away that it's two of you's family. They ask them, that's your mother, that's your family. So that means they target my son that day and the other guys in the Ronald. So what I'm asking is, my son and the other guy, they didn't do nothing. I just raised awareness as other mothers, black, white, any color in Washington. My son and the other guy, they didn't do nothing. Abdul Rizak, I don't have even family in Seattle. They're asking me, that's your family? Because he's Somali. They know we are Somali, we are Muslim. And that, that's what happened that day. And the, after two hours, we hear they are downstairs somewhere. And uh, the girls went there. And the uh, evening, I hear they taking to the back to the shelter. That is not right. My son, he's supposed to come home. He's finished his time, eight years. He was working in the work release. He was, you know, just 25 days after he's coming home. They come to my house and check it. They say, you know, your son is coming. You have to put a telephone line. They check us at my house. I have four bedrooms. I say, he have any room upstairs, downstairs. They can't live anywhere. They check my back, I mean, background, me and my husband and my daughter. And we already even to come home. His books, he read in the prison eight years, they deliver in my door. And I see that box and I say, is that Leila's box? Because Leila, she always ordered something on Amazon and uh, I was reading his name. I say, thank you to Allah. This is Liban Adam. First time I see his mail is coming in my house, eight years. I was waiting my son, my husband is sick and he have a stroke patient. He was waiting him, his grandma, his family, his cousin, his nephew, and nieces, his community is waiting him. Liban was ready to come out. I said, Liban, when you come, Mama, he said, I will help you with my dad. You go work, and after shift, I'm taking therapy to my dad. He was ready to come out. His ID, his request, his ID in the Department of License, he come home, and I was looking at his ID. He was a baby when they arrested him. He was 19 years old. He get regular ID. And I say, this is Liban idea. Alhamdulillah, he's coming home. He was ready to come home. And that, that, that day what happened was, they say they didn't listen. They didn't, I mean, uh, follow the rule. The guy's ready, he's working, he's coming home. He's, everything's ready. He have an account we open for him. He have a credit card, his job ready for him. He have interview loss, the store. He get an interview, he get a drug test, he was ready to get a job anywhere, even our community, Somali community. My friend say, Marianne, when your son come out, let him talk to my boys, let him ad advise them. I say, yeah, he's coming soon. Even he have a lot of big family. My family from Kenya, from Ethiopia, from Somalia, from Seattle, Washington, they all waiting him. He did okay. nothing that day. And uh, sorry, I just take a lot of time but I have a lot to say, and I'm sorry, guys. Anyway, um, uh, I need a justice, and my son need a justice. And uh, what I'm waiting, my son come home. He have a home. His room is ready. His clothes is ready. His shoes is ready. His ID and his work is ready. His dad is waiting him. His grandma, 80 years old, waiting him. Thank you, Mother oh. Marianne. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you so much. And we love and appreciate you. We're going to pass it back to Nikita. Thank you. Um, Mother Marian, thank you for 
for sharing that. We want, we want Liban to come home too and want to continue partnering with you to make that happen. Um, you just heard from Mother Marian Adem, who is the mother of Liban Adem. And uh, we're also going to hear from Leila Adem, who is Liban's sister. Leila, can you help folks understand what happened to Liban and others at the Reynolds, sick, um, at Reynolds work release? on May 1st after they were taken. And can you share a little bit more of the process of how Liban learned about his infraction and the concerns that came up for the family? Yes, hello everyone. Um, so just leading up to May 1st, um, in April, Liban and others at the facility expressed concerns. Uh, many residents at the facility, they were showing signs of COVID-19. Um, and instead of receiving care and compassion, they got the complete opposite. They were told anyone who was sick or tested positive, you would go back to prison. Uh, they were told, um, you know, no, pretty much no PPE. Men were still working. They were going in and out of the building. Just like my mom said, the facility at that time housed 80 men and there was just four restrooms. So that's a four, excuse me, a 20 to one ratio. Anyone with basic common sense would know it's only a matter of time before there's an outbreak. DOC failed to act. And that's exactly what happened. People got sick, people tested positive. It was, it was horrible in there. You know, my brother told me there was a whole floor of people that couldn't uh, taste or smell. So they were really ill. Um, on May 1st, there was a peaceful protest organized by community leaders, family to bring awareness to the condition. That's, that's all we could do. My sister Ayan was actually one of the guest speakers. Later that day, we received a call from Liban's friend that said, hey, Liban's been gone for a couple hours. There's a van outside. That's the van that takes people back to prison. Something's going on. And Liban didn't do anything. He didn't do anything. He stayed in his room. He wasn't trying to be a part of nothing. And something's going on. You guys need to come down here. So me and my family went down along with uh, Girmai, and we couldn't believe it. We knew Liban would never do anything to jeopardize his program. Keep in mind, this is someone at the age of 19 who was sentenced to eight years. He's 27 years old now. He was 30 days away from coming home. Why would, why would someone in the right man try to jeopardize that? So we knew something is completely off. This, this is not right. Um, so, you know, we did everything that we could to follow up. We sent emails, we, you know, were calling and just got very vague answers from DOC, you know, riotous behavior, banging on windows. It was just very vague. Um, and the, the gentleman did not get due process. They were placed in solitary confinement for days. Keep in mind, Liban was actually sick. He was fasting. This was during Ramadan. He lost 20 pounds during this time. And it, it just was completely ridiculous. Generally, you know, if you have a violation, for people that may not know, they'll let you know what it is that you did. You'll get something in writing, but these guys didn't get anything. You know, all, all five, six of them at first were totally lost and confused at why they were being sent back to prison when they were so close to coming home. So about 21 days later, um, from May 1st, they received paperwork that they could look out for just, tw just 20 minutes. And for Liban, it was, you use the restroom. That's why you were sent back to prison is you use the restroom. We have about one more minute, Layla. Okay, okay. So, you know, and there's a video footage as well to prove that Liban wasn't told he couldn't use the restroom. And they refused to use that in the hearing process, you know, to prove and put all of this to an end. So we're just really, really shocked about this whole process and none of these men deserve this. We are hoping today that DOC steps up, you know, takes responsibility, take accountability of their actions and just let them come home. It's all we ask for today. And thank you everyone for your time. Thank you, Layla. Um, and I just wanna, first of all, tell all of our families we stand with you and we love you. And I apologize if I interrupt you it's just to try to keep us on track so we can get to a little bit of Q&A at the end. So I will do some interrupting just to, to move us forward and asking our speakers that come ahead to be mindful of time. Um, you've heard from Liban Adem's family 
and there are other families that we will hear from today. There are also uh, eyewitness accounts and uh, legal advocates that have been working on this, as well as elected officials. Uh, Council member Girmay Zahilai, both uh, as an elected official and as an eyewitness, saw what happened. So stepping back, uh, Council member Zahilai, will you share what you observed and the concerns you have as an elected official? Can you tell us why you stepped in to support this family and the Reynolds Six. Absolutely, thank you, Nikita. Um, I just wanna set the context real quick because the context is really important. To have a family member incarcerated during a global pandemic is to live in constant terror. You live in fear every day that your loved one is one breath away from contracting a deadly virus and die, dying alone in a cell. So let's start off by putting ourselves in their shoes. I was with the family that day outside of Reynolds work release facility downtown, and I was asked to come support however I can. At that point, all the family knew is something happened in the facility, and now they hadn't heard from their brother in several hours. Radio silence. Now let's go back to that context again. They're already living in terror, and they haven't heard from their brother in hours. And I'll never forget the desperation I saw in their eyes when I asked when they asked me to speak with Reynolds staff because they were not able to reach their brother or get any confirmation, physical or verbal, that he was okay. Um, I was able to go inside and check on Liban. And, um, and I remember he, I will never forget how emotionally and mentally distraught he looked. And he told me that he didn't do anything wrong and they're just making excuses to send him away. Um, I joined this group to advocate for Liban because we need to right this grave wrong right now. It's very easy for politicians to point at faraway injustices and denounce them. We see that all the time. It's much harder to reflect on injustices that are happening in our own backyard. And this is one of them. I think about the fact that Liban had already served almost his entire sentence, eight years or more, He's in the tail end, he's virtually free. Reynolds work release is only for people who are on their way out. What could have possibly happened for them to extend his time in prison and not only in Reynolds work release, back to state prison for several more months with no defined timeline for release. And again, this is in the backdrop of a global pandemic. So every minute he spends in a congregate setting like that could be a life sentence for him. And then you hear what the allegations are, needing to use the bathroom, making noise, things like this. Those do not rise to the, any level of putting somebody's life at risk. This is an injustice, the same dynamics that we see on a national level of black be people being harmed, black men crying for their mothers, their mothers waiting for them and hoping that they don't die in the hands of our criminal legal system are being played out right here in our own backyard and we have to fix them before we point our fingers at anyone else. Thank you so much, uh, Council Member Girmay Zahilai, um, for laying that context for us and for sharing your eyewitness account and your continued advocacy with the families. Uh, another advocate that, that has been partnering with the Reynolds Six and their families is Nick Allen, who is an attorney and legal advocate with Columbia, Columbia Legal Services. Uh, Nick, can you give us insights on the Reynolds Six member Abdi Mohammed's case, including his battle with COVID-19 at Reynolds and at the Monroe Prison Complex? Yeah, thanks. Um, as you mentioned, Abdi Mohammed was one of the six men removed from Reynolds work release on, on May 1st. Mr. Mohammed was not accused of committing any infraction. Uh, rather, he was removed because he tested positive for COVID-19. Uh, I wish Mr. Muhammad could be here at today's press conference to describe his experience both at Reynolds and Monroe, because what he described to me is deeply troubling and should be deeply troubling to all of us. Um, and I can't do his story justice in the same way that he would be able to explain uh, his several week ordeal, which is still uh, ongoing. Uh, Mr. Muhammad was one of two Somali residents of Reynolds at the time, the other being Mr. Adam, uh, and was working at Reynolds, doing everything he needed to do to be on a quick path uh, to release back to the community when in April he began experiencing flu-like symptoms. Uh, due to these symptoms, he believed he may have contracted COVID-19 and he wanted to do the responsible thing, 
and let staff and residents know as soon as possible, especially since he knew there were other residents in the facility that were particularly vulnerable to exposure to COVID. Uh, he told Reynolds staff about his symptoms and the need to be tested, but instead of working quickly to get Mr. Muhammad testing and informing other residents, uh, DOC delayed his access to testing. Uh, they told him to keep quiet about his symptoms. They put him on room restriction, but kept his roommate in the room with him, potentially exposing that person to COVID. They required him to continue to use the shared restroom facilities. They continued to tell him he wasn't sick with COVID and they refused to provide him with any medication. Once he was tested, they tried to continue to conceal the results. They wrongly told him that the hospital would call DOC to inform Reynolds staff about his test results. When the hospital called with uh, Reynolds uh, to speak with Mr. Muhammad, staff said he was not there, even though, as I mentioned earlier, he was in his room on restriction. When Mr. Muhammad finally contacted the hospital, they asked why he hadn't called back, told him that they needed to speak with him directly about his results due to privacy concerns, and then informed him that he tested positive for COVID. When Mr. Muhammad told staff that he tested positive, they told him stop saying that. Only when he got the hospital to send over a fax uh, to Reynolds were they finally forced to believe him. Even on the day of the de uh, demonstration, while Mr. Muhammad was still in his room, problems continued. A sergeant came to his room and asked if those were his people rallying outside. The sergeant further antagonized him, telling him, you're not sick, and uh, explaining that he's creating a problem that could be seen as inciting a riot. When the demonstration was over, Mr. Muhammad was transferred to Monroe and placed in isolation. But rather than receiving any compassionate or humane care for treatment of this potentially deadly virus, he was thrown in a cell and mostly forgotten about. He was placed in isolation in the intensive management unit for 22 days. And during that time, he was on 24 hour lockdown with no time out of his cell. He was allowed one shower during those three weeks. He did not have a change of clothing. He did not receive any medication. He was not allowed to make any phone calls. He was deprived of anything to pass the time. No TV, no books, no nothing. When he asked for a book, staff refused to provide one, telling him that he would contaminate it. His symptoms were extremely severe. He was vomiting, suffering from intense headaches, suffocating and having difficulty breathing, and he was scared he was going to die. His only human contact occurred once per day, and, and sometimes twice when nurses would come to check his temperature, but nobody would respond to his calls for help. When he pushed an emergency button, nothing. When he asked for help during the daily checks, they would tell him they were only there to check, check his temperature. The extended isolation coupled with the effects of the virus impacted Mr. Muhammad's mental health as he felt like he was going insane. Adding to these feelings was the fact that staff did not even wanna look at him. According to him, he was treated as if he was less than human. Mr. Muhammad was released from isolation a little over a week ago and remains at Monroe. Unfortunately, his story is not uncommon, as we have heard from other people in the prison who tested positive for COVID-19 and who have experienced similar circumstances in isolation. Instead of being treated like patients and receiving appropriate compassionate medical care, these individuals are punished for reporting their symptoms and contracting COVID-19. They are forgotten about for weeks on end and placed in inhumane conditions that are worse than any punishment that they could receive if they had been uh, infracted for disciplinary behavior. Mr. Muhammad and others never thought they would have to go through something like this simply for being sick. Thank you, Nick. Um, I really want to just emphasize from, you know, you just told us that that someone inside a Department of Corrections with COVID-19 was not treated with care, but was treated with isolation. Uh, something that most world organizations recognize as torture. And, and so instead of being offered care, he was removed from Reynolds work release, which is as close as a person can get to being fully released from the Department of Corrections and he was put back in prison placed in isolation with no care no medication no opportunity to shower except for once over 22 days and all because he went to the bathroom uh, during something happening outside of Reynolds work release while he had COVID-19 
I think it's just really important to understand the horrific ways in which he was treated. And uh, there are many men, uh, there are many men in Reynolds work release, many men in prison that are being impacted by these, these poor policies, these inhumane policies, these torturous ways in which departments of correction, the Department of Corrections is quote unquote dealing with COVID-19. Um, another one of the Reynolds six is Demetrius McNeil. His uncle Danny is with us. Uh, we're going to hear more about Demetrius. And I also want to remind us that Demetrius, like the other five Reynolds six, was removed from Reynolds work release on May Day simply for going to the bathroom. Danny's family has had over five decades stolen from them by harsh sentencing and over punishment. Danny, my understanding is your nephew and your family had not had not been actively advocating around COVID. We know that Danny also has a new baby and was ready to get out. Uh, can you share more about how this arbitrary Department of Corrections decision has hit, harmed, deeply impacted your family? Is that me? Yes. Yes, it's you. Daniel's, da Daniel's uh, uncle, Daniel Kibbe's uncle. Did you say Demetrius? Oh. Yes, that's oh, Demetrius me? McNeil. Hey, I'm, I'm Daniel Kibbe's cousin. I mean, nephew, uncle. I'm so nervous doing this. No worries, Danny, you got this. Um, I just got, I, I, first off, I would like to say, uh, God bless to all the mothers out there and, and other family members who are going through this. I too well know what this is because I did a straight 25 years there. So I know how the health system is. One of my Muslim brothers actually lost his toe because they didn't, they gave him inadequate care. Um, when I found out Daniel was going to work police, well, first when I finally was locked up and I asked his mom if he was going to work release, I told her, have him get, give me a call and I'll get him a job where I'm at. I got him a job and his first day there, he impressed everybody. So, and he was looking forward to coming home to be with his wife and, and, and his children, you know. And then a couple of days before he got, a, got sent away, his address gets approved. So I, don't, I, I know Daniel wouldn't do nothing to jeopardize that because from the time he started working there, I was in his ear. I was on him and I'm always, I'm always going to be in this corner and I'm always going to stay on top of him. So I don't understand why these guys want to retaliate like that. But like I said, I know DLC all too well and they are built on retaliating against people because they might just retaliate against me for speaking out like I'm speaking out, which I don't care. I got three more months of probation, but I'm still working. I've been at my same job for the past two years. I'm, I'm doing everything legit. I'm trying to reach out to other youths and, and, and individuals that are having a hard time. And it's not easy because I'm dealing with a sick wife who's recovering from a stroke. So my, my time is work and taking care of her and myself and our pups. And my, and my nephew was looking forward to getting out and coming home. You know, that's why he was doing so good down there with me, you know, and if he gets the, when he gets the chance again, you know, I want him to come home, you know, because it, it has impacted his mother, you know, because she not only has him to worry about, he has her other son, Leonis, to worry about, who's been down for almost 20 years. And I still have to try to do what I can to help him, you know, but he, he's proud of how I became transition from being in prison to out, to out here. 
it wasn't it's not easy it's not easy by a long shot you know but but for the grace of god i'm still here can you share with us a little bit about uh danny's new baby and the situation that the department of corrections has created for your family in terms of him not being able to be home you know, it, 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 he has a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful baby. You know, um, my sister named him Daniel after me, but he was looking forward to getting home to spend time with his with his with his child, and you know, try to do the right thing this time. You know, because the time he was there with me at work, I was steadily in his ear. You know, you need to get away from that that negative stuff. I said, even if I have to get you myself, I will, because I'd rather you be around me than be around some, some individuals that mean you no, no good. You know, I not only work one job, I got two jobs. I work two jobs. I try to stay busy. I try to keep myself busy because I know an idle mind is the devil's playground. So... Uh, you can tell I'm kind of nervous. Uh, he, he, he's a good person. He has a good heart, you know, and I'm, I'm really worried about him and the rest, you know, due to the fact that I know how the healthcare system is in DOC. I know what they will and what they won't do for you. And it ain't what they will do for you. They will never do nothing for you except cage you up, block you away, and hope nobody speaks out in your behalf. Thank you so much, Mr. Williams, for uh, sharing your story and for letting us, letting us know about um, letting us know Danny. about Danny. I'm sorry, I'm getting moderator messages at the same time I'm trying to talk. Um, so yes, could we have a moment to hear from Danny's mom? Oh, Paula? Hi, my name is, yeah. I'm Paula Smiley, my son Daniel Kibby. He was subject, he was getting ready to be released too. And he has five children. He has a um, some teenagers and this, his new baby, but my son is a really wonderful father. He didn't get in trouble with the law until he got a little older in life, but once they got a hold of him, they won't seem to let go of him. He's a wonderful person. He has a beautiful heart, and I just don't want him to catch anything while he's in there, and I thank you guys for everything that you're doing to help get my son out of there. I was trying not to be emotional, but I really, really appreciate everything you're doing. Like they said, I have another son that's been locked up for 20 years because I didn't have the money to pay for a lawyer for him. So we're praying for this, my son, the youngest one, to get out as soon as possible. In Jesus' name, I pray. I thank you guys for everything, for letting me in. I'm at work right now, and I'm on my, um, they let me come participate in this um, conversation, but I have to get back to work um, right now. So I um, thank you for letting me talk, and I really hate to get out of the um, conversation, but I got to keep my job. Thank so, you so much, Ms. Um, yeah, thank you for all that you're doing, and I'm praying for everybody's family member and I really got to get back in here to work. So thank I just you for letting me participate. Paula is an essential worker and many of our families are on the front lines of, of this pandemic while also trying to figure out how to support their loved ones in the Department of Corrections. So thank you, Ms. Paula, for taking the time uh, to be here with us today and to help shine light on what has happened to the Reynolds Six. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Uh, and I just want to clear up my moderator mess that I made. Um, Danny Williams and Ms. Paula are family of Daniel Kibbe, and Sybil Grant is the mother of Demetrius McNeil. Next, we are going to hear from another mother, and Mother Brown has been an incredible partner with the other families in doing this work to get the Reynolds Six free, 
and she has uh, consistently reminded us of our goal and grounded us in our intention. Um, Mother Brown, your voice has been so strong and insistent that we need to bring the Reynolds Six home. Can you share some parting words for our, our listeners today about your experience fighting for fair treatment for your son with the other Reynolds Six families? Hi, this is Mother Brown, mother of Isaiah Thomas. Praise give an honor and glory to God. My son was one of the six guys that got took to Shelton. He was only at Reynolds work release about two weeks. I lost contact with him around May the 1st. We're expecting him to come home, and then we don't hear from him. That was unusual. So I called the work release. They said, oh, your son has been sent back to Shelton. I'm like, what? And then we all know what happened to them, the way they're being treated. So I had lost contact with him for a good three weeks. And with the help of the community, I located him. They are bullying these guys down there, tormenting them, torturing them. My son called me last week. He said, Mom, now they're threatening to send me to Monroe. He has no infraction. They said, oh, well, he's been demoted. So I lost my train of thought. Just give me a minute. Now, my worst fear is um, losing contact with him again because he's not registered at Shelton. He's not registered at Monroe. He's just there with no infraction, living in the worst conditions you could imagine. Where we're at home in our closest houses, these guys are living, mm, I can't even say the words to describe it, when is enough enough? When they can't breathe, their only crime is for them being black. Now they did their time, they served their sentence. If they were that mad at them, they should have sent them home. They're right on their way. But no, for no reason. When is enough enough? When is enough enough? This is it. I'm ready to sue. For all, I want justice for all rental work release. All of them. Not just these six, because there's three stages. Some of them went to prison. Some of them are at work release, wherever that is. And some of them are sick. And I demand justice for all of them. And I'm ready to sue for $100 million for each one of them, excluding the lawyer's fees. Thank you very much for hearing my story. Thank you so much, Mother Brown, uh, for being such a powerful, insistent voice and keeping us focused on uh, the goal and thinking also not just about the Reynolds Six, but all of the men in work release, all of the men in the Department of Corrections. It's so important that we understand what is happening to the Reynolds Six is really just a microcosm of the injustice of the, of the mass incarceration system and the criminal punishment system. And this is just a reflection of, of the injustices that Black peoples have been suffering within the United States for a very, very, very long time. Uh, We've also been working with legislators and uh, in particular, Senate members of the color, the, the, the leaders of caucus, color caucus. Um, and we have one of the co-chairs of the Senate members of color caucus. And they're going to speak to, uh, specifically, Senator Rebecca Saldana will speak to and give us a sense of what other electeds have been encouraging the Department of Corrections to do and how they should be moving forward in regards to the Reynolds Six. Rebecca Saldana, can you, can you open our eyes to the work that you all have been doing from your position as electeds? Thank you, Nikita, and thank you to the families who courageously share your stories with us today. 
Uh, I just want to speak the names of the individuals that we are here particularly to focus our attention on. Mr. Isaiah Brown, Mr. Daniel Kibbe, Mr. Abdi Zakar Mohammed, Mr. Anthony Sands, Mr. Demetrius McNeil, and Mr. Levon Adam. Black Lives Matter, these six Black Lives Matter. As the co-chair of the members of Color Caucus, um, I think it's important just for a moment to recognize that we have no Black leadership in the Senate um, of our Washington state. And those um, Black legislators that we have um, in the House um, are all up for election this year. And that means that the campaign restrictions limit their ability to speak up. And so it is part of why I'm here right now, um, representing um, our collective um, voice and making sure that a lot of us came of age at a time when we were being tough on crime as a state, where um, racism was further embedded into our state policies and our institutions and our systems of throwing away lives instead of recognizing that every individual can make mistakes, that there can be a time of corrections and um, accountable, accounting for it, um, and returning back into our communities. And so it's when this um, particular situation at Reynolds came to our attention, uh, we immediately reached out to the Department of Corrections Secretary Sinclair to ask for an accounting um, and uh, were dismayed to find that it took so long um, for anything to be put into writing, um, for any communication and clarity to be provided to the families and to the individuals, and that um, we are calling for the spirit of transparency and justice uh, to be, um, that it's the Department of Corrections, um, that it's their responsibility to provide that um, and make sure that safety of individuals is the number one priority in this time of pandemic. And so, as was said, um, you know, by by the by the letter of the law, they are allowed up until two days before to be able to wait to be give, give it anything in writing to these individuals before they have to go before a hearing board without um, any representation um, and defend themselves, which is. Um, really made clear to me that we have more work to do um, in terms of policy change. Um, but in the meantime, we are calling on our Department of Corrections for leadership. And um, they have responded saying that they're willing to meet again with the individual family, the Adam family, um, and uh, we are in the midst of scheduling that meeting to happen. Uh, and will be working um, to make sure that all individuals in Reynolds are being protected. Uh, in terms of context, I think it's important to know that at least on the public record of Department of Corrections, that they have identified that there's two um, employees and uh, at least seven individuals that were found at positive with COVID-19. Um, and, um, and so that is on the public record. I think it is important for us to make sure that we are make, uh, getting clarity on um, what's happening to individuals when they um, are tested and found positive. And we will continue to um, stand with the families um, to seek um, release as soon as possible of these six individuals, but looking for much more permanent um, reforms uh, of how they are treating individuals um, when they are ill and how we are getting people out um, and holding um, our corrections accountable. Thank you so much, uh, Senator Saldana. Thank you to the elected officials that have been partnering with the families of the Reynolds Six and for the ways in which you have been using your platform and your access to elevate these concerns and to speak to other elected officials who do have power and authority to act immediately upon this. Uh, Anila called to the governor at the beginning of this press conference to, to ask him to take direct and concise action to ensure that the Reynolds Six receive justice. So we, we thank you for your commitment 
to ensuring that we get what these men deserve, which is to be safe at home with their families, not sitting in cages for unjust reasons. Um, and to be frank, really what we need is care, not cages. We need compassion, not cages, especially as we are in the midst of this uh, global pandemic and this public health crisis. We know that it is not a matter of if, we'll, if COVID-19 will hit our prisons, it's a matter of when. And we know based on this press conference, it already has. And we know that the Department of Corrections has not been transparent nor accountable about how bad the crisis is in the Department of Corrections. Um, we, have, we have some demands. And at the very beginning, we played a video of the men being removed from Reynolds' work release. And um, you heard the voice in that video crying, uh, obviously feeling immense hurt and fear, it is the sister of Levon Adem, uh, Ayana Adem. And we want to close out with the family's call to action. Ayan, can you share with us what's on your heart and where you would like to see things go? During a deadly pandemic, our loved ones were sent from work release to prison for just using the bathroom. Just hours after a peaceful rally, which I spoke at, demanding for safe and healthy conditions inside. Reynolds was also under a 14-day quarantine to a coronavirus outbreak inside, which was our worst fear as a family. The situation in Reynolds was even more alarming when we found out that our loved ones were sick, but they were scared to share with DOC staff due to the ongoing threats and intimidations that they would be sent back to prison if they tested positive. Our loved ones did not ask for the coronavirus. They served their time and would do nothing to jeopardize going back to prison. They worked so hard to get to where they were. They were happy to finally be home, closer to their loved ones, back in their communities, working, taking the bus. I remember how happy my baby brother was when he, when he got his Washington State ID. So instead of lifting these men up, DOC decided to retaliate against them. They put them in harm's way, snatching them away from their communities, violating their rights to due process and our rights to free speech. They saw me, a black Muslim woman, speaking on behalf of my brother, who I didn't even name. They immediately detained two black Muslims and sent them off to prison hours later. We believe that additional people, my additional brothers, may simply have been casualties of Reynolds staff covering their tracks for retaliating against my speech. Our loved ones were sent to prison just hours after a peaceful rally outside of Reynolds. This was clear retaliation. They never received reasoning on why they were being sent back to prison. Generally, if there's a work release violation, a hearing takes place at the work release facility. Instead, they were cuffed up, put in a white van, sent to prison in the midst of a pandemic. They were put in solitary confinement for several days without justification. Not was it only my brother's birthday, but it was also the holy month of Ramadan, where two of the individuals was observing. Four of the six individuals received their infractions 21 days after sitting in prison to only go through an unfair hearing where it was decided that they were all going to be terminated for work release and they all were going to get 30 days addition to their sentence. Two of the rental six never even received infractions or even had a hearing, which is just unjust. Nobody should go through that. Since May 1st, we heard a range of allegations from DOC, including riotous behavior, to participating in a disturbance, to yelling and banging at a window, and finally, it just resulted in them using the bathroom, which is their right. There's an actual DOC policy. So this was just wrong on so many levels. This was traumatizing for the rental six and their loved ones. No one should be punished for being sick. No one should be punished for advocating for the rights, and no one should be punished for using the bathroom. As concerned family members of the rental six and with very heavy hearts, we are asking for the immediate release of our loved ones. They did not deserve this. We did not deserve this. We are demanding accountability and the end to senseless retaliation in DOC. We demand the safeguarding of due process rights for those individuals who are having administrative hearings. Lastly, as concerned family members of the Reynolds Six, we are also demanding safe, healthy, and humane treatment for those in DOC custody, especially during this deadly pandemic. We also recently learned that DOC wants to send our loved ones to Monroe Correctional Facility, where a CO, a correction officer, most recently died 
we are asking that DOC do not sever our loved ones to this facility. As loved ones of Reynolds 6, we're asking for justice, we're asking for accountability, we're asking for safer conditions, and we are asking for the immediate release of our loved ones. Thank you so much, Layla, uh, or excuse me, Ayan, for, for sharing those demands, for your tireless fight and effort. Uh, can you tell me, just remind us all the first day you all started advocating for Liban and the men at Reynolds 6? What was the first day that you all were out? Yeah, the first day we were out um, was honestly, it was an, 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 we started messaging in March, right, when the coronavirus happened. But the first day we were out was April 11th. There was a, some other families that organized. We were outside. Um, we had a peaceful rally just saying, you know, please, governor, consider releasing these individuals because a week later, a week before, they had to release 60 individuals from King County Jail. So we said, please, just release our loved ones. We released the video of my mother speaking in Somali, just saying, please have my son come home. You know, we've, we've sent time. Oh, so many emails, so many calls, so many pleads, you know, uh, we tried literally everything and, and this started, you know, in March. We saw this happening. This was our worst nightmare. Our loved ones served their sentence. We didn't want them dying of the coronavirus because the lack of, of, of following public health guidelines. This was our fear and this happened. And not only did it, did they probably get coronavirus because my brother lost 20 pounds, they were sent to prison and now they're saying, you, you can't go back to work release. And so yeah, we've been advocating. We tried every single thing, every avenue possible. And this is, this is where we're at now. Thank you. So since March, uh, this family has been advocating for their loved one. It is now June 4th. And rather than having Liban and the other Reynolds 6 home safe, they are back in prison for using the restroom. I think that that is the salient point that these men are back in prison in the midst of COVID-19 for using the restroom. Uh, some of whom, whom did not even receive an explicit infraction like Isaiah Thomas. Um, some of whom's families were not actively out advocating, but all six of these men are suffering the consequences of the Debar Department of Corrections failure to effectively respond during COVID-19 to the Department of Corrections racism and white supremacy xenophobia, Islamophobia. And so we are here together as, as allies and accomplices partnering with these families to uplift, undergird, and amplify their message and their demand for justice. So we'll open uh, it up for some question and answer. We are a little bit over time, but you are welcome to send me a private message and at which point I will uh, ask the question and direct it to the right person or family member. All right, I'll allow one more minute to see if uh, questions come in. Maybe folks are typing. Hey, Nikita, I got a question. Uh, folks ask, who should we write to to advocate for their release? Thank you, Anila. Uh, sorry, I should direct it. You asked it. Uh, <laughs> Who should we write to? Uh, I'll start first with asking our elected officials and our community advocates who have been uh, working towards amplifying the voices of the families within the institution. Can you all speak to some people that should be written to? All right, I'm gonna just call people out. Uh, Nick Allen, can you speak to some folks that you think should be written to? Yeah, I mean, um, I would suggest, um, you know, uh, along the lines of what, what's been discussed here today, your, uh, your elected officials, the Department of Corrections, I know the governor has been thrown out there. Um, those are probably uh, three uh, starting places for trying to get answers and trying to get the 
uh, relief that the that the families in the community uh, are are seeking. And then within that, I see, you know, I just saw a, um, a, a, a chat come in, specific individuals probably within, within all of those uh, um, agencies or, or organizations. Thank you. Anyone else want to add? I will just if add not, that I'll we're going to be, sorry, Nikita. No, go ahead. I was just going to add that we will be following up with the people who registered, uh, the community advocates who registered on the form. Uh, we'll follow up with action items and specific folks to contact and uh, sort of sample letters as well. I've also received a question regarding public advocacy letters. Yes, there are some public letters. Uh, I direct you to either contact Anila or to contact Jamie Hawk at the uh, American Civil Liberties Union of Washington. Uh, and they will have a letter that civil rights organizations can sign on to that has already been sent in, but it is something that more organizations could sign on to. Uh, we have a question here from Jim Brunner, uh, wondering if anyone can release documents showing how DOC responded to individual cases. And Nick, I'm gonna ask you if you could speak specifically to the issue of documentation and what is or is not available. So we don't have any documentation right now um, uh, with regards to the major infraction reports, the discovery uh, packet that is served um, along with the infraction, uh, the hearing officer decision, um, and uh, trying to access that information um, so that we can review that. But, but we don't have access to it right now. I do think that uh, Michael Schuler is also on the call and may be able to offer some uh, insight into um, what occurred at the hearing and what other information might be available um, as a result of that. Uh, the other thing that's of course out there is, um, is the, the video footage, um, which none of the individuals were allowed to use at their hearings, even though there's um, a number of cameras throughout uh, the, the work release facility. Um, in which all of the individuals have uh, said they could use to uh, exonerate them um, uh, 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 in a finding of uh, guilt uh, at the infraction hearings. Thank you. Uh, if someone from our organizing body could please put the names of all of the Reynolds Six in the chat, that would be helpful for people wanting to write to the governor and advocate for them. Uh, I have a question regarding whether or not there is a fund to support the Reynolds Six. I believe that is in process and as that is developed, uh, we'll post it publicly with COVID-19 Mutual Aid Seattle, which can be found on Instagram and Facebook, as well as has a website. If someone could also post that in the chat. I will just add that my office has also explicitly um, put in writing and request for um, access to the video footage, to the discovery um, pack materials um, on behalf of the Aiden, uh, Aiden family, and um, that we um, are continuing to follow up um, with the Department of Corrections. They have said that they are currently reviewing that footage to see um, how they can release it um, through public information. Um, so we will continue to follow up on those particular pieces of evidence and materials. Thank you so much, Senator Saldana. Uh, another question directed specifically at the, the Senator is, have you all spoken with Governor Ensley and what has been the outcome of that? We have um, directly kept in the loop um, his point, his agency staff person, um, not the agency, but from the governor's office, um, uh, Sonia, Halem um, has been um, in conversation. We have not had a direct conversation with Governor Inslee on this particular issue. Um, I do think that um, it is a request that we have, um, and I do think that that is something that um, Senator Wynn, um, Representative Johnson, and I you know, will um, continue to work on that piece. Thank you so much. Uh, I don't have any other questions in the track or in the chat that are specifically media questions or directed at a specific person. I see the names of the family member of the Reynolds Six 
and some of their family are now uh, being added to the chat. So as we close, I want to reiterate the demands of the families. The first being the families and supporters of the Reynolds Six, we demand immediate release of our loved ones. We want accountability from the Department of Corrections to end this senseless retaliation against the families. And we demand the safeguarding of due process rights for those in administrative hearings. And lastly, we must underscore that people in prison are a community like any other community. They are our loved ones. They deserve to be safe, healthy, and be treated humanely. And when they're in DOC custody, especially during a, a pandemic like COVID-19. Uh, so if there are no additional questions, those are the demands. I see that Anila has posted them in the chat. And uh, I'm hoping that we can get those out. They'll probably be on the COVID-19 uh, Facebook and Instagram. They should also be present in uh, the press release. If they are not, we can send out a press update or a press advisory with those demands that you all have written access to them. Uh, feel free to email or call our press contact or reach out to Columbia Legal Services or Council Member Jeremiah Zahile's office. Uh, they have helped us organize this press conference today and are uh, supporting the Reynolds Six and their families as we move through this process. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll remain on the call for a little bit as we close out if there are other needs or questions. Thank you, yeah, everybody. Um, Thank you so much, Nikita. Thank you. Thank you. I will be in touch with you guys and let you know about me and uh, how Paula's doing, because I know she sounded kind of emotional. She worries about her son. Lots of love to the families. This is Davida. As the guests leave families, we're still here with you. Let's let the room clear out. Um, and I'm not quite sure if we'll keep this line open. If not, we can set up another Zoom chat or another another Zoom chat. Um, just send them lots of love to everybody. Thank you. I'm on my way to work. Danny, I will be amazing. Thank you. Uh, I got nervous. Everybody said exactly what needed to be said. Thank you for speaking from your heart. Thank you, Willard. Willard said thanks to all who've deemed every life worthy to be advocated for. Lots of love in the chat. Danny, don't read the chat because you're driving. <laughs> but we're glad to ride with you. And for everybody who helped behind the scenes, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much for having us. Yes, and for families who did not get a chance to speak, um, just know that the organizers are still here to support you. We are gonna be immediately following up with calls to action. So please don't worry, we're still here. And if we could stop recording, that might be good.